Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Maryland online session, Generative AI, two years in. Where we are we? Where are we going? So we're coming up on an anniversary. ChatGBT uh, came upon us in November 2022, and it has been a journey, a very fast journey, a wild journey, and it's ever-changing. Uh, we have some wonderful panelists, and I get to them real quick, but I just looked before today. I just looked, I saw that 70%, surveys say that 70% of people are using AI at work in some form or another. So we as educators have a responsibility to take a look at that, and I think we are, we are doing that. And of course, we see new, new generative AI applications coming out every day. So we're going to get started. Uh, instead of me introducing our, our panelists, I have asked them to give their intro uh, and talk about how they are using AI at their uh, for themselves and at their school today. And we're going to start with Cynthia. Greetings, everybody. Thanks for coming out today. My name is Cynthia Pascal. I am the Associate Vice President for eLearning at Northern Virginia Community College, just uh, just over a bridge from y'all. Um, and, you know, I'll be honest, I use generative AI literally every day, multiple times a day. Um, if there is anything that really involves writing, it's, it's part of my daily practice. And the reason why is I'm dyslexic. And so... Um, it helps me form sentences and thoughts in a way that is actually legible to others. Um, so I use it a lot in just basic writing. Um, also, like many people here, I'm ask, being asked to use do more with less, right? And so I use generative AI to really help me meet those goals. Um, summarizing meeting notes, um, tools like Zoom now have AI summaries and AI question and answer. So I use that regularly. Um, I use it for creating flyers, things of that nature. So basically I use it every day for almost everything, dot, dot, dot except when it requires a personal touch. Um, and so I, I have learned the hard way uh, that generated AI has a time and a place, but not for everything. And so with that, I will pass it over to my counterpart, Dana, to introduce herself. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, my name is Dana Gallo. I am the Associate Dean for Teaching, Learning, and Technology at Cecil College in Maryland. Uh, just like Cynthia, I use it every day. Um, any kind of form of writing, especially emails. Uh, yes, we all wear many, many hats and have limited time. And what I love about Gen AI is that I can write the key highlights that I want to be said in the meeting, or excuse me, not meeting, but in the email and just pop it out really quick. It had the spellings, you name it. I'm the worst typist. So I write it out real quick. And it spits out something that sounds better than probably anything that I'd ever say. <laughs> and it's very, very quick. And I love it for that. Um, so I get out emails very quickly. Um, I also use it for summarizing meeting notes. Nobody wants to take notes in meetings. I don't know how many of you have been in a meeting and they ask, who would mind taking the minutes for the meeting? Now I'm that first person to be like, hey, I don't mind. I'm going to use Copilot. Uh, so we've been playing around with Copilot at my institution just to see if we would even like it and if we would use it. And absolutely I would, um, especially when I was away on vacation and I came back to hundreds of emails and I was able to ask Copilot to summarize them for me um, and let me know key things that I need to uh, touch on right away. And it did, it was unbelievable. I actually forgot about one thing I was supposed to do to respond to somebody and it reminded me that I was overdue. So it's, pretty unbelievable what this tool can do. And yes, it has a time and a place, um, absolutely. For more personal touches, definitely. Um, but in my just regular working day, yes, I use it um, for most things. Now for teaching and learning, because I want to promote it to the faculty, there's a lot of hesitation and some people who are really excited about it. It feels like it's a spectrum and some are a little bit curious. And what I found it really good for is helping writing learning objectives creating rubrics, uh, quiz questions, you know, kind of getting your juices flowing. You know, you have an idea about an assignment, maybe you want to put a tweak to it. Um, you know, that's been something I've been really looking into tools that I can integrate inside of Canvas called uh, one in particular, we're, we're looking into, it's called Conmigo. I'm sure you've heard of it. 
<laughs> I'm getting some clapping from Cynthia and just playing around with that. The rubric builder was wonderful. Uh, a refresher. It's good for like discussion prompts. I love that. Um, helping with announcements that I create in, in my courses that I teach and to help again, let others know about it as well. So I've been finding a lot of uses for teaching and learning so far, because like Ron mentioned, it's ever evolving. But so far, I enjoy it for that. And also for UDL, because I'm really focusing on how does AI help students with disabilities in their courses? That's kind of like a passion of mine. And I was curious and in, in hearing from Cynthia, Cynthia that she uses it because she has dyslexia, you know, that's a big one or ADHD. How can it help or hinder? So I've been kind of doing some research about that. So that's a little bit about me. I could talk forever, but I won't. So Diane, <laughs> I'll give it to you. Thank you so much, Dana. I am Diane Alonso. I am the program director of the UMBC psychology program at the University of Shady Grove. Um, I'm also principal lecturer. My primary role is in faculty. Um, and I'm also currently serving as the special assistant to the vice provost for UMBC Shady Grove Academic Innovation. That's everything. Um, <clears throat> I am, don't use it as much, but I'm working on it. I'm learning a lot about it. My background is actually in computer science. Um, I had an undergraduate degree in computer science mm -hmm. and was an early, very early user um, in the early 1980s. Um, I took a class where we had to do some sort of, we read a book called Gerd Lesher Bach and we had to design a project and I wrote a poetry generator. Um, so it was really, really simple, but um, I can say that I actually did get the chance to do that. I created a database and had it generate poetry. I also took a course early on, a, just a few days of a course that was a an online, it was TV screen and telephone course on AI. Um, a few days of that. So that's that's sort of my background in AI. I, I have had an interest in tech because I do come from technology, from computer science. So my psychology area of interest is cognitive psychology and experimental psychology. And I've wrapped my tech background into that so that my research when I was doing it um, was in the area of technology in the classroom. And that's sort of my convoluted path to get to where I am now. Um, I don't I'm, I'm learning about chat GPT and AI and all the other tools. Um, I'm currently co-chairing uh, or co-facilitating a faculty learning community through our faculty development center. And it's on using chat GP, uh, AI in the classroom. And of course we're reading Bowen's book and talking about some other, other books that we're looking at, articles we're reading and discussing how, what are some best practices? We're trying to come up with some ideas. Um, we're, you know, as in my role for academic innovation, I am in the process of surveying my faculty. Uh, like I said, I'm a program director at Shady Grove, and I'm I'm reaching out to other faculty at Shady Grove to see what types of academic th innovation they're doing. Um, not specifically in ChatGPT and AI, but that would definitely be part of it. Um, but I'm also for my department, I spend a semester as part of my workload, just doing uh, gathering information, reading articles, creating a database. I create a huge database of chat GPT, uh, Gen AI related articles, podcasts, links to things. So I'm, I'm in the learning phase, but I'm really interested in it. I know, I know enough to be dangerous. Um, <laughs> I personally have not been able to get myself to use it. I love to write. Um, and so it's hard for me not to write, but I have tried a few simple things on my own. One of them was to, um, I, I worked with a colleague on a listening tour uh, where we spoke with faculty and staff and others who are involved with our program. And just for fun, I decided to see what kind of executive summary I could come up with. So I, I had to generate that. Um, I've done a few other things just to kind of test it out to see, but it's, I haven't quite integrated it into my workload yet, but I'm also, I, I do believe that it's something that can be used quite effectively. And I do under, I agree. I think Dana had said about the, the, the spectrum of users that we have people who are terrified and won't go near it to people who are all in and use it all the time. And at UMBC, we're really trying to figure out where is it going? We have other committees that are working on policy and things like that, but that's part of what I'm hoping to find out too for our FLC and also for my department. So I'll probably be presenting something on that later this year. And that's 
pretty much my intro. Thank you very much, all of you. So as you can hear, folks, we have a tremendous body of experience, both in the last two years with, with AI, generative AI, and beyond that. And, and I've been really been wonderful to pull these folks together so we could talk about a little bit more. Just two little pieces of housekeeping before we progress. Uh, one, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. We have Marjorie Rohauser is monitoring that and we'll bring in the questions. And also make sure you stay until the end so that you can get the slide with your certificate of attendance. Uh, and that will be presented at the end of the session. So stick around for that. Um, so thank you very much. And I just would like to note that here at Chesapeake uh, College, uh, you know, we're working with AI, generative AI a lot. We have developed a policy uh, that's very open. Uh, one of the key points was it's, it's, specific, it's institutional and it's, it's put it in the arms of every department as to how they want to apply AI within their area. So it's not too prescriptive, uh, uh, making sure it's open. But we felt it was important to have it in place. So my question, my, my next question to all of you, and uh, please, whoever, raise your hand who wants to go first or just start speaking, and we'll go from there. So where, did, two years ago, November 2022, where did you start with generative AI at that point in time? What happened? What do you tell us about your story? I'll get us kicked off. I am. Um, I had heard murmurs about generative AI, like it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, and um, really didn't think much of it. Thought of it more of a novelty. I think is is the right way to say it. And then um, one of our super techie people went to a conference just over the bridge in Washington D.C., and the entire speech uh, was presented in using generative AI, but then they did generative AI in the, uh, as the Beastie Boys. So in that voice. And I thought that was so clever and silly um, that I was like, I'm going to touch it. Um, and of course, just like everybody else, I had no clue about prompt engineering. So I, you know, I created this account and I started putting stuff in and what I was, you know, garbage in, garbage out. I was getting some wild stuff, but it was fun. And once he touched it, it was so easy that it almost made it impossible not to use. And, um, and I'll be honest, for me, I was an early adopter just because of, because of that, because it was so easy and because I saw value immediately as someone who's dyslexic. Um, but also it was so easy to get people over the hump of, of learning the tool. If I just showed them how to do it, they just like me had kept hearing about it. You know, it was all over the news, Gen AI, Gen AI, um, chat GPT, which is kind of like saying Kleenex at, um, at this point, it's just a brand name of generative AI. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, let me just show you. And literally it would take 30 seconds to create an account, right? It takes very little time. It's mostly the multi-factor authenticator where it sits to your phone. And then I just asked him to touch it and gave him a little bit of context, like write an email. Do you want it to, a, you know, uh, a parent or to a student or to a faculty member? Um, write what you want to make about it. And do you want it to be formal or informal? And I just gave him a simple prompt and immediately they were able to do it. And that's how easy it was to adopt. And that's how easy it was for us two years ago to kind of get over that hump. Now, I've come a long way since then, but that's that's kind of what the starting point was, was just it was a novelty. And now um, I honestly can't live without it. I'll be <laughs> which is sad uh, because I do know how to write. And I promise you, you know, I'm a smart gal, but, uh, you know, work. Work smarter, not harder. Ladies. It's funny you said, you know, you can't live without it. Um, you know, we that's how we become with social media, with all the other things. You know, it, it draws us in. Um, two years ago, I mean, obviously, as I said, I've, I've sort of known that AI was coming. I've, I've worked and touched on it in different ways my, myself. Another friend of mine who worked, um, I had worked in a lab doing neuroscience work and uh, the 
person whose lab I was in worked with someone who was designing a language uh, learner back in the 90s. So I've seen bits of it over the years. And in cognitive psychology, we do hear a little bit about the rumblings and it's coming. So I, I kind of always had it in the back of my head. November 2022, I hadn't used it at all, though. I hadn't had any connections to it myself. I mean, since hearing about it in the past. And so it was not even really in my in my mind at the time. Um, it did start to get in my mind, and I think it was in the fall of 2023 that for one of my classes, I realized I need to start talking to students about this. Um, I don't think that my students knew a lot about it at the time. Um, I really try to get them to be honest, uh, to, to, to open up. Um, so I taught a course, and uh, it was a cognitive psychology seminar. It's a writing intensive class. And I started the class with um, a Google form. I, I use Google everything. Um, can't live without that, uh, the Google suite. And um, the first day of class, I asked them to let me know what they knew about it, what if they'd ever used anything to get some feedback. And I think for the most part, people didn't know. And I designed, using ChatGPT, a an activity for students to do the first day of class to get them to know what it was to learn about it, to learn about the things that work well and how to be cautious and, you know, where you can depend on things. But it was it was just an intro and most students had never touched it before. I think I had one student who worked in a law firm who had used it a lot for writing emails and all sorts of things. But most everyone else had no idea. Um, I told students, this, you know, I told them my policy and, and at UMBC, a lot of people have made their own policies. And I also refer to the APA policy. Um, again, very general, very flexible. Um, but, you know, I, I tried, you know, I let them know this is a tool. You can use it. Don't write your whole paper in it and turn in a chat GPT. I want to hear your writing. I want to know what's in your head. And I do. It's an iterative writing process and I give a ton of feedback. So I think it's tricky to write a whole paper in it because you can't just put one thing in and one thing out. There's lots of steps to the to my process. Um, and we went through the semester at the end of the semester as part of the course content, because I talk about decision making, I talk about various topics related to uh, cognitive psychology and chat GPT really is. It's about learning. It's about language and things that we very much talk about in, in the class. And so on one of the last days, there was a summative paper. It was a, a paper that uh, addressed many different facets of ChatGPT. And I, I have it somewhere, but I didn't pull it up before this meeting, so I don't have it handy. And that had been one of the assigned readings. There was that one. And then there was one that was a little more kind of how do people feel about it? I think it might have been a Washington Post article or something like that. And I have my students lead uh, the first half of the class and discuss the paper. And we had a really great conversation, discussion about using it. And by this point, the students had started to list, look at it and hear about things and really were giving some great insights about where it's helpful, how it's helped them. We have a lot of students at, at our campus in Shady Grove who are, English is not their first language. We have students with disabilities. Um, and so it really helped them. A lot of them have used Grammarly and things like that. And it really helped them get that final paper cleaned up, which I'm fine. I, I don't like reading grammar errors. It gets me a little cranky. Um, so I'm happy for them to have a clean paper as long as I'm hearing their ideas and getting their writing style. I don't want to hear something full of jargon. And I've told them this. But um, I was able, we were able to talk about things like that. And um, then also things that people had seen in the news about actors who were having their personality, you know, their their likenesses taken over. And what does that mean? And what happens when you have kids and people start using? So the pros and cons, you know, it was, here are some really great things you can do with it. You know, there's some wonderful things you can do, but then what about the hallucinations and the, you know, if you're, if you're going through a database, you know, if you have data that's only good through a certain point, you're not getting new data and the biases. And so we really talked about using it intelligently. And that's sort of the underlying message I try to give in all my classes is we're not, we're almost not teaching facts like we used to because everything's out there. Everything's on, you know, you can Google things. But we need to teach people how to be good learners and how to take whatever information they have and use it in a responsible and knowledgeable manner. And so, of course, we're teaching critical thinking. And to me, that's just part of ChatGPT. It's yet another tool we have, just like our phones and social media and all that. 
we're going to be using it, or at least it's there for us to use, but we have to know how to use it intelligently and thoughtfully and not abuse it and understand that there are risks. So that's sort of what my angle has been. And I, I'm so far going in that direction. And I'll, I'm sure we'll catch up more stuff on another question. But I will. Uh, I know, Dana, you haven't had a chance to answer this question, I don't think. So I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Diane. Yeah, I want to say I'm just like you, Diane. I, I heard about it, the murmurs, you know, back in 2022. Didn't really think much of it. I mean, I think I remember my daughter years ago saying she could talk back and forth with something like this. And I thought it was creepy. And <laughs> to be honest, I'm like, I don't want you doing that anymore. But who knew that's what it was going to be and that I'd be using it all the time. But once I start hearing about it on the news, it starts to bubble up at work, you know, a little bit. And then it really came about, I want to say too, probably probably spring of 2023, when faculty were seeing plagiarism, unfortunately. And that's what it really surfaced for us. You know, students were figuring it out and were unfortunately using it um, to write their papers or at least attempt on some of the discussion boards or partially write their papers. And yes, that's unfortunately how it came about. And I was kind of charged to start really researching AI, um, going to different conferences, speaking with different individuals and what kind of policies that they are starting to institute at their in their colleges. And it seemed to really vary from just talking about it to whole, this is what we're doing. This is how we're implementing it in our classes. This is the syllabus statement that we're using. Um, so that's what we started to do um, at our college is get together this committee to start writing up a general policy um, for class. And really we're trying to leave it up to the instructors, you know, to use it in some ways, because it is just a tool. Um, I really just think of it as autocorrect in some ways. It's compared to as the calculator. I think it's a bit more than that uh, because of the other implications. You know, we see it with music, you see it with art. It's a little different, but it is a tool that we're going to have to be flexible and kind of evolve with it. Um, and that's kind of, I feel like the mindset that we have right now, it's like, it's here, it's not going anywhere, but we do need to be open and honest and educate our students about the ethical principles and yes, the biases that come along with it. Um, that's, I think, really important to get across to students. And just from my talking with students, some are apprehensive to use it. You know, I know some are using it, unfortunately, to plagiarize, but I think that's a small subset, to be quite honest with you, at least from my experience. Um, I think they're interested, some, but others are kind of afraid of it. Uh, so I think it's education. I think that's where we need to head. And I feel like our institution is kind of leaning towards that. And also, I, I think it is a good assistant for faculty and staff with their day-to-day -day work um, to help things you know, be more productive a little bit quicker, since we do wear many hats, but not replace by any means. That's our expertise. So using it as a tool, I think, is key. But yes, unfortunately, I'm addicted to it too. And I think we all are just like our cell phones. But it's one of those things that I think we'll use it seamlessly and not even be having this conversation um, to a degree because I think it'll be so embedded into our day to day. Thank you all very much. You know, you, Cynthia, you just said you, you can't live without it. And Dana, you just said you're addicted to the cell phone. When you were talking, it just reminded me that uh, something that I think that was attributed to Steve Jobs or something like that is that no one asked for an iPhone. You know, and it's and it's like no one asked for generative AI, you know, and, and yet it, and yet it's here and it's developed and it has gotten so popular. So I, I think you all sort of touched upon the next question. And and I'm gonna go I'm going to, this time I will pick somebody out to start. Uh and I'm gonna ask you, Diane, but again, this is for everybody. So what have you learned from students, faculty? and others and their interaction, their interaction with generative AI that has informed you along the way? So good question. Um, I'll start with faculty actually, because I, I, I interface with faculty a lot. Um, and again, I think as I sort of mentioned, as we alluded to this before, I, I've seen a really wide range of reactions. I know there are faculty who really don't want to have anything to do with it. They really just would rather ignore it. Um, or I have faculty who are seeing this as purely, um, you know, if anyone uses chat GPT, they're going to be in trouble. We're punishing them. If there's no, this is not a tool. This is, this is the same thing as plagiarism. So they've completely, you know, put those two, two uh, topics together. And I see them as, you know, 
it's a very difficult place to be. I think they're going to have a very hard time. Um, and I'm hoping that some of what I can bring to faculty, especially faculty in my department and faculty at Shader Grove is more of an understanding of how can we live with this, even if you don't like it, you know, you have to figure out how to coexist. It's not going anywhere. And I'm guessing that the faculty aren't, maybe some are. Um, so there, there's that. Um, obviously, I'm not going to, the people who really are are interested in that, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, the other uh, you know, the other side of it, and, and I can kind of understand this part myself, is that as faculty, we are incredibly overloaded. Um, I think everyone here has, has talked about that. Um, we're overloaded with so many demands. It's not like just standing up, teaching, grading, and you're done. There's all sorts of things now, and, and a lot of really good things. You know, we have DEI and we have SDS disability services, and we have bringing belongingness into our classrooms, and we go beyond teaching. You know, I just used to go through a textbook and teach my my chapters. I don't, we barely even look at my textbook anymore because we're teaching so much beyond that. Um, so unfortunately to me, this seems to, and I think to some faculty, this can seem like just one more thing we have to, to worry about. How are our students using it? Some are probably worrying, are we teaching them? Because there've been there have been articles saying, you know, students need to know how to use chat GPT to go into the working world. Are we supposed to be teaching them that? You know, some people feel like, yes, as faculty, we are. So I'm teaching cognitive psych psychology, but I'm also teaching chat GPT. Some people, and there are lots of faculty who don't know you know, I don't know a whole lot about it, but some faculty are going, I have to teach chat GPT on top of my course. It's a heavy lift. And so I really, I don't want to just act like the people who are not excited about it are wrong. Um, I think there's a lot of genuine concern. And, and again, there are problems, hallucinations and things like that, that happen, biases and all sorts of things that are brought in. So there are a lot of things I think that are true concerns and things that we need to figure out how we're gonna address and how we help faculty. So not just dropping them off and saying, use ChatGPT, teach ChatGPT, embrace ChatGPT. Um, so that's part of what I'm trying to think of right now is how do we help those faculty um, as, as we try to help our students. Um, the students to some degree are a similar way. I mean, I think a lot of them do see this maybe as a tool to use, but I think we also tend to overestimate our students' ability to use technology. I've been astounded in the past at some things that students could not do and how long it took to figure out some things that to me seem very simple. Um, I do have a little more tech background than some, but still, I, I always thought, oh, kids know how to do everything. You know, <laughs> They're the geniuses, but but that's not true. And some are, are, some are scared of using it. Some don't really know how to use it effectively. Some are mis mishandling it. Um, and then some, of course, are are running with it. Um, and I, I have people who use it very effectively too, students who use it very effectively. So it's it's kind of right now all over the place. And that's what makes it, I think, in some ways really difficult is to figure out there's not one, this is not, this is what we're doing. It's all over the place. And, and we need to start to figure out how to help the people who are feeling overwhelmed, the people who are scared, um, how to get them to maybe, they don't have, not, wouldn't force anyone to use it or to teach it, but help them understand it a little better so it's not the unknown. And then work with faculty and students who know just enough to be dangerous, <laughs> but help them use it effectively and really understand what to do with it. And then for those students who really are using it effectively, you know, possibly use, you know, grabbing onto what they know and helping, having them help others. You know, we, we often use teachers to help other teachers, students to help other students, you know, teaching each other. But I do feel it's, you can't say there's just one place where students or teachers are. We're all over the place. And that's, I think, what makes it so difficult in so many ways. But hopefully we'll start to understand it better and figure out how to address it. And then of course it will change. So I'll go from there. Thank you. Dana. Yeah, I want to say similar to Diane. I mean, it's just such a huge spectrum. And I, I primarily work with faculty. So that's the side that I'm hearing the most. And it's such a wide range. I mean, I think mostly I hear the concern, especially from writing professors, and rightly so. I get it. Um, and then there's the other side I hear from math professors who are like, ah, I'm used to it. You know, that, that was always been. <laughs> and that's like calculators and so on. So it's, it's such a wide range, but there is interest. I mean, there truly is some interest, either if it's negative or positive, 
but they're asking for more and more training on it. And that I'm happy about because it means they're giving it a chance. They want to learn more, maybe just to be armed so they know what to expect, or maybe they're thinking maybe it could help them because of the demand that they have in their course loads and extracurriculars, everything that they have, it could help them. But I think it's just, it's good to at least know what it's doing. You may not be totally happy with it, but they want some hands-on practice. And that's what I've been hearing. They just want a moment where they can go in a lab, say, here are some of the tools, play with it. I feel like that's the best way you can really truly know the tool and understand it is actually use it yourself and see its capabilities and its limitations. Because there are, you know, as you're working with it, you realize like, no, they, I guess they could write a whole paper, I guess. But typically from what I've seen so far, because I'm sure it's just going to get better, it could be kind of vague, you know, unless you do have the good prompt engineering, it's not going to be the best paper. So even if you didn't use something to test it to see if it was AI generated, I bet you, you probably wouldn't give it a good grade anyway, because it would be kind of vague and not the best. Or it's the opposite. And you're like, I know they wouldn't write this way or say these words. It's kind of a trigger, but it's good to play with it. And I think keep an open mind to it. And hopefully with students and just in research that I've read, again, it was a matter of some are apprehensive, some are upset that people are using them to cheat, so to speak, because they're putting all this time and work into it. So they're a little nervous about it as well. And again, I think that comes back to, you know, actually learning about it themselves maybe integrating it into the classroom, but I don't feel like every you know, people should be forced to do it. It's whatever they're comfortable with. But I, I do also hope that in time that it won't be like such a negative word hearing generative AI. We have to, again, evolve with the tool. Cynthia? Um, you know, I, I was thinking about my mother while y'all were talking. My mom just got a cell phone, like not even a smartphone, a cell phone. So it's kind of one of those things you got to meet people where they're at, right? Whether it's students, faculty, um, staff, you know, instructional designers, you got to meet them where they're at. Um, what I think is uh, a constant theme with faculty is um, there's a spectrum, right? And a lot of the spectrums are um, based on fear versus fact which that happens to you. I get go to fear first for everything. It's fun part of anxiety disorder, but there's, um, there's this fear of the unknown. And so there's a lot of, I don't know about it. So I'm going to make assumptions about it. This is what I've heard, or this is what I've seen. It's this isolated case, but I'm going to use a, um, the straw man argument and use it for everything. Um, and so, so I say that to say that I have found that education about it has been helpful across the board. But as I speak about faculty, what I've also seen is teaching them how to use it both for AI inclusive with the assumption of maybe they want to learn more about it, but also being AI resistant. I don't want to learn anything about it and I don't want it used in my class. And both answers are okay because it is. Opinions are like belly buttons, right? Everybody has one. Everybody's allowed to have their own opinion about it. I just built a class. Um, uh, we use template classes at Nova Online with a peer and, psych and I'm a psychology instructor as well. And we used artificial intelligence um, for, for some assignments and not others or within some assignments and not within other parts. And that brings me to the next part, which is the student part, right? And what I found with the student part is they need clear guidance and expectations as they do with everything. We used to have that joke, it's in the syllabus, right? You know, the t-shirts, the faculty member, it's in the syllabus. Well, it's in the syllabus now. And one of the things I do is I include it in, in the syllabus and I say, you know what? I am pro artificial intelligence. And I'll let you know when to use it. But there's, you know, you there's only so many things that can be said about Eric Erickson at the end of the day. But there's certain things that I'm going to want your experience or your cultural opinion or whatever. And I really can't get that from generative AI. So I'm going to tell you, and this is how you'll know. And then I'll give them rubrics using transparent design to show what I'm looking for. Because generative AI hasn't figured out my rubrics yet. Although generative AI created my rubrics. That's a spoiler alert. Um, but I tell them exactly what to do. And I make sure it's bold. So we know 
when I, it's okay to use AI when it's not, but also what are the consequences when I just said it wasn't allowed to hear that? So there's never been a code of conduct issue in my class as it relates to generative AI, because everybody knows what they can and can't get, can't get away with. And so I use that as a model um, for what I do. I also model that behavior within my classroom. So that cheat sheet I just told you in the syllabus that I have, I put at the bottom, use with the help of generative AI, this is how you cite it. And I teach them how to cite it. And I put that in every single one of my um, uh, courses. I put like kind of directions, resources, um, and then like a overall what you can expect. I, I use a, a formula, I guess. But in, anytime the AI is allowed to be used, I put the reference guide there. This is how you cite it. Um, and anytime it's not able to use, I give them the how to cite other books using, you know, APA formatting, which is my expectations. So I give them the tools to be successful and meet them where they're at. And then I use that as an example when I talk to faculty about things they can do or when I talk to instructional de designers about things they can do. Admittedly, I don't do it on everything. So like the citing, um, if I'm making a article um, and it's a blog article, I won't necessarily say use, use with general AI to edit, but you'll know kind of like if it looks stinking, smells stinky, probably stinky. Same thing with AI. If it looks like AI was used, smells like AI was used, AI was probably used. But I find that um, if I just leave transparency, transparently, people know what to expect. And so they know from me that I'm always going to use AI to edit. Um, I'll put original thoughts in, but it's going to do the editing. Um, again, I give faculty the tools to succeed, students the tools to succeed, but also my instructional designers. And um, I think with everything, as long as everybody's on the same page of what is ethical and responsible and doesn't um, compromise your students or your school's data, then I'm pretty fair game. I did just in case you're not someone who loves looking at the chat, I'm huge into chat. So I did put some resources there um, in case you're interested in what others have done. Um, some people are hard, no, never on syllabi statements. And some people are like, it's fast and loose, wild, wild west. And these are the examples um, that you can see as well as um, guides to teach critical media literacy, whether you're in the classroom in a physical space or distance learning space. These are some questions that you can ask very easily. What do you guys think? Tell me what you think. Um, and with that, I'll stop. Thank you. So before I go to the next question I have, I'm going to do a follow up. Uh, you know, uh, Cynthia, you told us about your story, how about this has helped you with your dyslexia. And 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 Danny, you said you were looking at how it's help, helpful for people with learning disabilities. I'd really like to hear more about what you're finding out and where you're going with that. Well, a couple things. One, as a user, it has been game changer. There's also... Um, there also is a newer product, and I can't think of it right now, but if you look at generative AI dyslexia, it's a tool built specifically for people who are dyslexic. Um, and so that's very helpful. But what I also do is kind of run everything I do through generative AI and say, can you rewrite this at a sixth grade level? I just redid our website recently and they're like, hey, we have students from everywhere, you know, they, and their parents are looking at this, you know, how, how do I do it with this lens? How do I make sure someone who English is their third and fourth language understands it? Um, how do I write this, rewrite this assignment? I have a student who just said they need accommodations for being ADHD and I just don't, I've never had to write this assignment in that way. You can easily create accommodations just by plopping it in to generative AI and saying, hey, can you tilt this to be more inclusive for people who need accommodations with X, Y, and Z? It's been transformative in my work um, in terms of it's, you know, students who use screen readers and maybe I have a PowerPoint that I really phoned it in when I created it and didn't think about someone being visually impaired. Um, you know, putting it through and say, can you write this out for a visually impaired student? Um, so that has been really helpful. Um, we do require universal design, but you know, 
it's easy to be lazy. It's easy to choose an OER resource that, by the way, looked good at one point and then changed, you know, or uh, uh, even a publisher resource where they're, they're like, it's totally ADA compliant. And you're like, it is not, but thank you. And so that's where her, um uh, generative AI has been really helpful to make sure the students are getting what they need, but also the faculty. Like, how do you support these students? How do you support someone um, who uh, has Asperger's and learns differently than you do? Or who takes, um, because of their ADHD, takes negative feedback really hard or anything that can be perceived as negative feedback? And so how do you use emotional intelligence with that? It gives you directions for everything. Remember, it's data mining from the best and the brightest. And Cynthia is smart, but not the best and the brightest. So I'll, I'll pull, give it to Dana. Sure. Uh, yeah, just from some of the research that I've read, I mean, it sounds like so far, again, we're so early stages that it is helpful to some students. Um, kind of like what Cynthia was talking about, it could reframe certain things for students. So if it's, say, for example, an assignment that an instructor has given. Maybe it's very long instructions. They can put it in, and I put it in the chat. It's Goblin Tools, and they could break it down in chunks, and it gives them an estimation of how long it would take to do something. So that kind of like series of steps really helps them in checklists. So that's been something um, that I've read that has been pretty helpful, um, especially for students helping students um, where English is a second language, they could recommend it. It can help them, you know, go through the text, help them with their writing. I think actually Diane kind of touched upon that as well. That's something else that I've read. But then there's the biases and the ableism that's out there too, that it's kind of training. So we have to be careful. So there is some help, especially again with, oh, there was another point I read. A student um, who was on the spectrum, I guess, corresponding with their professor, they needed to make the language not sound as abrupt or abrasive. So they would go through, you know, put it in more casual or kind tone. I don't know what the word would be used, but it helped them in their correspondence. So I think they're just starting to see some of the effects that are positive. But of course, we have to realize there are some negative. Again, the way that garbage in, garbage out, like Cynthia was talking about, think about it, you know, like what this is being trained with. And that's, I think, as a society is interesting. We need to get that to change, right? So it is somewhat helping, but I'm also using it for faculty to help. We all know about the Title II changes that are coming, where April 26, 2026, it's ingrained in my brain. Everything has to be accessible, which it should have been 20 years ago, let's face it. But, you know, it, it just now there's a hard, fast and deadline. And what I have been recommending to my faculty, because again, it's a lot of work. We are trained to teach with PowerPoints that have minimal text and it's all images. Well, guess what? They're all inaccessible. Not many people put all text. And that's what I put in the chat, <laughs> excuse me, is the Arizona State University has this incredible image accessibility creator. I am in awe of it. So everywhere I go, I talk about it. I hope they don't start charging because <laughs> we've been using it religiously. You put in an image, and I especially try to trick it with like the hardest image possible that has a bunch of data in it or charts and whatever. It is so specific. It is unbelievably like accurate. I mean, you might have to go in a little bit, but I haven't found that yet. And it's good for the alt text, which has to be like 150 characters or less. So it has that, but then the description, that's where it's wonderful. So I'm trying to help my like science, like STEM faculty because they use a lot of charts and I'm trying to help my art faculty, you know, with all their imagery that they use. And this tool has been, I think, incredibly helpful. Like I said, I, I hope they don't start working <laughs> because it's a fabulous free tool. And it also helps you with building rubrics too. So I hope you could check out that website at the ASUs. It's been really helpful for our institution so far. Diane, you have anything to add to that? Or... You're on mute. Sorry, no, I knew that. I, I was I was actually writing down, I, I have everything saved in the chat, but I was like making a note of this because I don't want to have to go through all my, I'm thinking of that too. I'm going through, oh, we were talking about it in our undergraduate program meeting. I was like, I don't, I mean, I did, one course I actually did take through Quality Matters and did do everything in accessibility, but I've got so much stuff over the years. I've been teaching for over 20 years. Um, so it's a lot of work. So I was 
frantically taking the notes about how it puts in an image and generates the alt text and the description. So I want to capture that. I'm learning today too. Um, you know, nothing that hasn't really already been said. I think these are great points. Uh, I actually have a daughter who's on the spectrum. Um, I don't know that she's using this, but maybe it's something I will also bring up to her. She she uh, had been in college and I know there were some, some challenges. Um, so these are great things to be thinking about. I do... You know, I do think it, it's very helpful. And I think to the point, I can't remember, I think I, maybe you both said this, the idea of ableism and biases, there are those problems as well. So again, it's it always seems to be a balancing act of how much good before it starts becoming a, a problem. But I do think there's some great resources and, and this is really wonderful to know. And like I said, I'm I'm learning as we go. So I'm always taking notes and trying to figure out what we can be discussing. And this will be discussed at RFLC on Friday. <laughs> so, so my next question, and I think you've all already started touching on this one, but how are things evolving or changing for you and in your workplace in, in the short term? You know, the next, the next uh, 60 days, the next uh, six months, how are things, how do you see the use of AI or how it's approached in the short term? So, I mean, I'll, I'll start just to be a little different. Um, <clears throat> I do see at our university, we're taking it very seriously, taking this as, I don't mean seriously, seriously, but we're taking this as an issue that we need to address. So I appreciate that UMBC is being proactive. I think the people who are here today, probably your universities are being proactive and, and really trying to understand this. So I do think we're, we're doing a lot to get the word out. Um, we, I, I attended a couple of weeks ago, we had the, our provost symposium. Um, it's, a, it's a faculty development center event, and there's also a lot through faculty development. So we've been having seminars and workshops and at our provost symposium, we had our guest speaker lead a discussion about AI in the classroom. Um, we're, I appreciate that our faculty development center is holding a lot of, um, like I said, workshops to discuss it. We're having a, you know, we're talking about the Bowen and what is it, Watson book. We've been having uh, um, reading groups. And so I appreciate it. And I see that there's being a real effort to educate the faculty. Um, and so my hope is, is that our faculty will be on that front edge. We're not gonna be the ones left behind. Obviously some people aren't gonna come to these events and you can only push people so far but it's, it's available. And I think that's a really good thing. And, and as much as possible, I, whenever I talk to my friends and faculty, I try to talk this up, you know, come to these events, learn about what's going on. Um, I think it's really, really helpful. And as our faculty learn, and as our faculty come to understand what's going on, they can then be helping the students more. So I think that we're, if we can be educated Understand that it's constantly evolving because I don't think we're ever going to get I don't I don't know we're going to get ahead of it, but to stay on top of it and to be aware of where it is, how it's evolving, you know, is it getting better and easier to use or is it getting more complicated? You know, I don't know where it's going to go. I really don't. It could go in so many different directions. Um, but I, I do think the that to me, education, knowledge. Um, and, and a good amount of knowledge, again, not, not just that amount to be dangerous, but a good amount or to be scared, right? And to be anxious, but a good amount of knowledge to really keep involved. And again, I know faculty, students, everyone is way too busy to sit through lots and lots and lots of webinars and seminars. So thank you to everyone who's here, by the way, <laughs> taking the time out to come. Um, but I do think these have been helpful for me to attend. Um, exchanging ideas, the FLC I'm in, we're talking, we're constantly talking about it. So it's out there. And I think that's so much better than putting our heads in the sand and hoping that it will just pass over us and, and not hurt us or anything like that. So, you know, knowledge is power. Dana. Yeah, I'm kind of with Diane. I think at our institution, I mean, they, I want to say about a year ago started this committee and a representative from each, I would say, department, as well as even staff, because it obviously affects staff as well, and trying to come up with a policy to give to students, knowing that they're using it more, and they know the ethical implications that are involved as well. Um, so 
I think that's going to evolve. I think we'll continuously have that group, plus then probably have subgroups at that point. Um, change with it. I, again, I think just arming them with knowledge. Um, last year, we had our first ever symposium, um, faculty curated, led, you know, facilitated. It was fantastic. AI was the hot topic. And I have a feeling it'll continue to be. Um, but I'm starting to see the shift of this is what it is and why we're scared of it to this is what I've learned now and how we may want to use it, but how we could also teach our students about it. So I think it's just kind of evolving over time. So a lot of, I would say, you know, faculty run workshops, we have done it um, in, my, in my department, as well as even inviting outside institutions to talk and, and share what they've been going through, I think has been very helpful. Also, Educause, I'm a member of that. So I've been in their forums religiously, hearing about what other, you know, colleges, how they're using it, um, even if it's for like, say, peer tutoring, or are they using chatbots to help their students? So it's 24 seven support, are they not? You know, just like thoughts of how we can use these things to help support and make our students more successful. So I think we're kind of evolving with the times. It's never gonna be perfect, but I love hearing the different perspectives on the good, bad, and the ugly of AI. And hopefully we can embrace that. Cynthia? You know, it's a it's a challenge uh, for us. Um, in terms of, you know, you were saying 60 days. Right now, we have a lot of really AI-resistant disciplines. Um, and I have to acknowledge that. In a lot of ways, we're tiptoeing around conversations. Um, you know, there's this belief, even though it's not rooted in data that we can see, meaning, um, well, I'll tell you what the belief is. The belief is, is AI is rampant and being used for cheating. And that is an, a belief. It's not rooted in data that we're seeing. So not additional academic integrity or student code of conduct um, complaints being submitted. It's just a feeling. So on the one hand, we're trying to say like, let's suss out that feeling. In fact, you know, is, is it rampant and is it a problem or does it feel scary and we need to learn more about it or what do we need to put in place? So some of it has to do with less policy and more like a culture of uh, academic integrity, right? And high standards of excellence and respect and care. So it's working on that part of it, right? It's educating people, again, where they're at. So having those faculty learning communities um, having listening sessions, our, we have a new um, director of uh, our Center for Academic and Teaching Excellence, and she's doing listening sessions. What do you think about it? Good, bad, or ugly? Let me know. While we're doing that, we are pushing hard on the other side to say we can't afford to be left behind. 70% of our graduates are saying, uh, excuse me, we wish you would have told me about that. I'm in the workforce now and I'm not qualified in our um and our groups who uh our boards that inform our curriculum are like hey you're giving us people who who don't have modern tools for modern modern jobs and so we really have to address that so right now literally as we speak um and while I was typing over here, it's because I couldn't remember what it was called. We actually have an artificial uh, intelligence innovation fund summit going on right now where faculty and staff are pitching their ideas for up to $25,000 um, to you to to learn more about AI or to test something out. We had a lot of faculty fo focused ideas. You know, what if we got this product that's already built in, um, you know, already has a vendor for it? Or what if we tried collecting this data? Um, things that you would think are rather, um, like maybe low hanging fruit is a good way to say it. Like already, you know, we know it exists, but it doesn't exist here. But one of the things we did see when when the everything closed was faculty really, were really well represented, but student affairs was not well represented. Re represented, and so saying, "Have you thought?" I you know I'm not trying to pick on you, but transcripts evaluations are about eight weeks behind right now, and we can only do them for students who are actually registered to attend Nova. What would it look like if we added artificial intelligence to help us with transcript evaluations? What would it look like to create um, credit for prior learning assessments using artificial intelligence? Is that possible? 
is it possible to use it for academic advising or is that wild? And so what we're doing is really pushing people to think about how it affects themselves and it do I see myself as an artificial intelligence user? And is that just because nobody showed it to me using that lens? We talk all the time about students are cheating, um, faculty are using it to help their class or to, again, make it AI resistant, but there's a whole other group. What would it look like to certify faculty facu uh, faster? you know, through HR? What would it look like um, to use it as a tool to review um, uh, applications faster? And so just, just trying to use it in different ways. So we do have that going on right now. Um, and then last but not least, we are doing student-facing stuff. Um, I just launched, and I think I talked to you about this when I visited in the summer, um, we just la launched a badging system to engage students in the conversation of artificial intelligence, and, and, um, and it's a training um, to um, ensure that they understand how to use it ethically, responsible, responsibly, but also like as a tool. How do you write a resume? It's, it's really easy with artificial intelligence. And so um, getting them ready for that workforce. And so it's really pushing out the marketing that this exists, not only for online students, but also, again, bringing it back to, but we're not teaching them how to use it to cheat. This is a life skill you need, and this is how we're framing it. So again, while we're having this push for marketing, again, reframing it, we're not teaching students how to cheat. We're teaching them how to use tools ethically and responsibly in addition to all the other critical sk thinking skills that we're giving them. And that's where we're at today. Who knows what tomorrow will bring? Tomorrow's a whole new day. We still have a couple more hours in this work day. Yeah. I'm gonna have to follow up with you about this $25,000. <gasps> I know. Did you, did you get a lot of applicants for that? Um, you know, I don't know because I intentionally, this is the first time I haven't engaged in something. I went under the not my business part. I have enough initiatives I got to work on. Um, so so your girl has initiative fatigue. So I said next time. Okay, great. All right. So my uh, our, our, our final question before we open it up to any questions from anybody else. So we're two years in. The long view, two years from now. Any Any guesses, any... Anything you'd like to, where you'd want to project it will be, if you want to venture that way, if you, have you thought about it? I'd, I'd say, you know, just because I'm off mute, one of the things, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if uh, prompt engineering actually becomes a certificate or a program. Um, they are doing it at UC Berkeley, and there's uh, OER courses being designed in the California system. So, you know, education is slow. I can't speak for Maryland. In Virginia, it is slow. So building the program might not be fast and easy, but I could see even on the non-credit side being, you know, a quick and dirty, something that you can create. I see a lot of micro-credentials being added with that, both on the faculty end and the staff end and the student end. Um and then really, it it would be um, a huge disservice if we weren't able to redesign literally everything that we're doing to be more student-centered and, um, and engaging. I mean, now that we have the tools, before we had to do all the work, right? We had to do it from scratch and we had to bring everybody in and sit down and curriculum maps and what does this look like? Now you say, first module, psychology, I want them to learn this, write the learning outcomes, write how I'm going to measure it, write the uh, the transparent design rubric, um, make sure it's ADA successful. So there's no reason why I can't, I, this year we have 157 courses we're redesigning to be um, just completely redesigned. Normally we do about 25 a year. So that shows you the scale we're able to change things. So this time, in two years, I expect everything to be completely redesigned and to be more accessible and more modern um, for, for our today's learner, more adult-centered, um, more reflections of diversity. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that can happen. I also hope with this that there's more open educational resource opportunities because OERs are being redesigned super quick as well uh, because generative AI data mines 
all the best in the prices. And, and, and I think there's a place where we can do that and, and build some really great OER resources um, for our college students. Diane. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is really interesting. And I think you can, like I said, I think you can go in so many different ways. Um, I, I, I will go with the optimistic. I like uh, Cynthia's view. I, I, you've got such great energy and thinking about the future. Um, I tend to be, you know, I'm, I consider myself an optimist, but I also do tend to be skeptical, but I'm gonna try to look at this as, it is something that's here. It's something that can be, if, if we use it for good instead of evil, I think it can be really beneficial. I think with the internet, we see that a lot of it is really good. What we've, what's happened over the last, I don't know, 20 some odd you know, more years than that. Um, it's really grown to do a lot of amazing things. Uh, what we, what we, we were doing, I guess, almost 30 years ago um, was very basic compared to what we can do now. And we see such incredible growth. I think as we grow, we need to be mindful and we need to be thinking about where are those problem areas and and be trying to be to anticipate what might be coming up um just as as the internet is has grown in so many great ways there are problems and i think we have i think we have to be vigilant i know there are people out there who are doing that and i think that's important that there are people out there doing that um i think to the point of these you know becoming prompt engineers i do think that the jobs are going to change drastically um, I, I know there was, uh, it was an article I read or something where they talked about the kinds of jobs, you know, we don't want AI to be replacing people, but it, there are certain jobs that may be replaced, but then maybe those people can be, can learn to do other types of things that will supplement and enhance. So to use the tools of AI better, um, I think we need our students, one of the things I constantly say is we need our students to be flexible thinkers. We can no longer teach, I mean, it's not that students can't be skilled. I think there's great wonderful things for skilled workers and people who who do that but i think in terms of the academic life we have to really think about their ability to think flexibly because i honestly believe that the jobs of two years four years six years down the road we may not even have imagined now prompt engineering might be a first step to something that is so much more than that i mean we may be integrating this with i would imagine the next step would be integrating with virtual reality if it's not already happening and there's just so many places that we can go with this so i think our students in particular and of course our faculty because if we're going to be teaching our students we need to be flexible too and be able to think um you know faculty a lot of us i've been teaching for many many years and it's it can be very easy to get set in your way um, and to get set in your ways and to think this is, you know, I've been doing it this way and I'm gonna keep doing it. Uh, faculty need to be flexible in their thinking, um, at least to be able to stay on top of all this. And we, with our students need to really be looking to how we can change, how we can adapt um, and how we can use these things again for good instead of evil and, and really use them in, in the best possible ways. And, and at the same time, being always critical and vigilant. So um, I'll be optimistic with that little side of vigilance and, and, and uh, uh, caution. But overall, I'm hopeful that we will be using this in ways that really enhance society and help us and, and make our lives easier. That would be wonderful. Dana. Hard to add to that. Um, I think yes to both of those things. And it's hard to say where it's going to be in two years. It's changed so much just in two months. Um, I would just hope that, you know, we have more exposure to it, maybe, you know, help identify as a society, you know, what we're seeing with the biases, and maybe we can help correct that or at least steps towards it. My hope is that it will make it more of an inclusive environment when it comes to higher ed. I hope that, you know, for students, I hope it gives them more flexibility in their learning when they need it. I would love to see, you know, learning management systems have things embedded in it to help with support, especially because of mental health. Um, I don't know if that's even possible, but I would love to see it help support students. They feel like they have an advocate by their side at any time while learning. That's kind of where, I guess, for my own personal reasons, I would love to see that. Um, I just hope faculty get more comfortable with it, not be so scared, decide for themselves mm -hmm. if it's worthy of having it in their courses. I do see more certificates, you know, in non-credit and credit side of the house. I think it's inevitable. I think we do need to learn it to a degree where it's appropriate. 
but let the faculty decide, you know, where it is and isn't appropriate. So I still think we'll be in the learning phase. It's two years, but I think as, as most things in higher ed, it does move a little slowly, but I think it's good to proceed with caution a little bit. Um, I definitely think we need to be cautious, but also embrace to a degree. Well, well, thank you all very much. We have a few minutes left. If there's anybody in the audience that has a, a question, you type it in the chat, or I guess you could even open up your mic and ask the question. You've all given me a lot to think about. I've learned some new things. Dana, I, I think I want to follow up and, and find out, how, are you using generative AI to meet the April 26, 26 deadline? Because that is that's a big <laughs> So, uh, you know, uh, you'll be on my speed dial for that, I'll tell you. Absolutely, um, I'll let you know. <laughs> that, that's very helpful, you know. Um, but folks, any questions? Hey, you have other qu it's... questions you have, want to ask? Oh, there you go, Eleanor. Hey, I just, uh, hi guys. It's been really interesting listening to all your, your um, perspectives here. And I'm coming at this mostly as an instructor. And um, of course, the first, the initial fear was, oh my God, they're using it to cheat. And I have a lot of friends and colleagues who are still stuck in that spot. But um, one of the things that, that I have realized is that can, this can really make me rethink my assignments and how I'm asking them to do something that's more related to the way that people work now. Like we don't, you know, how many times can we say what caused World War One? You know, how how many times can we talk about uh, the meaning of um, uh, Kate Chopin's short story? You know, so I have to. I've been having to think about how do I rework my assignments, and in a way, it's to get around the ease of of pulling in something like that. But this started long before that when I saw students beginning to pull whole essays from some, you know, pinkmonkey.com. It's just, you know, a different iteration of that. So I think it, in that sense, it's a really good thing for all of us to reevaluate what we're asking people to do and to create more interesting assignments. And, you know, Eleanor, I couldn't agree more with you. I think this is, a, you know, this is where we start ringing the bell about authentic assessments, right? How do we know students are learning what we are teaching them, you know, and it isn't just writing a paragraph or a short answer. It's a lot of ways. How can they demonstrate learning? And so what can we take um from from our work and, and do it in a different way. What would it look like to video record an interview or um, to do a presentation or to explain this to a sibling, you know, the same context, you know, how would you explain this to someone else? It's, it's different lenses on the exact same thing that we've been trying to do. Um, and there's so many ways to do it that aren't just what we did, how we learned, you know, and, and that's, you know, I'm very thankful not to do scantrons and blue books anymore. That didn't work for me as a learner. Um, but like, what is it that's going to work, especially for our discipline and especially for our teaching style? The other thing is, is, you know, not everybody wants to listen to a, a hundred things, you know, not everybody wants to watch a video. So, so what is going to be most meaningful, not only for the learner, but for the faculty member as well. Right. And I, one of the things I've done the last year and a half is I've been adding oral exams to my online class. So I have, a, I actually have 15 to 20 minute conferences with individual students asking them to explain um, a presentation that they'd shared with the class. And, you know, that becomes their final exam. And yes, it's time consuming. But basically, I have the grading done when we finish the conversation. So it's a redistribution of time. And that's, you know, good for me, too. Yeah, I, I have to agree, too, is I, I see faculty, you know, we some of the people in my faculty learning community were talking about using oral exams or or if a student turned in something, they're like, this doesn't sound right. Come in and explain to me a little in more detail. I've been using Google Docs and real time writing in the classroom as well, so I can see them write as they're writing and watch the different students, uh, they'll do group writing or, and I can lurk and watch. And you're right, and and, and to uh, Cynthia's case point, 
we have to think about authentic assignments. What do we really want our students to know now? And it's not just a matter of regurgitating and giving us back information. It, we really do want to think about our students, you know, they're maybe a little higher up the Bloom's, uh, the Bloom's taxonomy, you know, getting up a little higher into really creating and doing things that are, are more advanced in some ways, because this lower level stuff is being taken care of in some ways. Um, you know, I think it's it gives us some some really great options for what we can do. So I think those are great. And the oral exams, obviously, in large classrooms, that can be hard. But if you have manageable or using voice thread or other kinds of things where you can get them to provide that feedback. And I think it also helps us or puts us in the position of getting to know our students better, you know, individually. And one of the things that's always been important to me is having them write about things that are meaningful to them. All the, you know, cognitive psychology again, will tell you the best way for a student to learn something is to make it personal. And so as much as we can have them personalize and, and address things that are in their own lives and relate their own lives to it, that's great. So what you're doing sounds wonderful. So that's great. Well, I'll, I'll, if I survive it again, <laughs> I've got two really, I've got several really full classes this semester. We'll see how well I do with it at the end of this semester. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, if there's no other questions, I'd like to just kind of recap some things I'm seeing here in the chat. Uh, way up in the top, uh, put, a, put a plug in, MOL, Maryland Online, is going to have a webinar in the spring on the ethical implications of AI. Okay. Uh, it, Frederick put in, in response to Eleanor, we have seen an increase of AI use to cheat in math assignments at Howard Community College. We are working to embrace AI and weave it into our math curriculum. We'll also put you on the speed dial, Frederick, on that, how you get AI into that math. And Cynthia has put in a lot of good information in here. Um, so she's been busy with the AI on it. So thank you very much. Cynthia, Dana, Diane, it has been a wonderful uh, hour and a half or, is it, or shorter. It <laughs> seems like only a few minutes, but it's been wonderful. Uh, Marjorie, you. if you don't Thank mind putting up the uh, the slide for people to get their credit for this. And, and I do appreciate the conversation today very much. Thank you all. Please keep in touch. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Please reach out if you ever have any questions. There you go. There's a slide awesome. for you all. Grab an image. I'm also going to put a uh, link in the chat to a um, post-session survey if uh, people want to find my chat here um i thought i was going to uh it's coming don't worry i gotta find my uh if you want to fill that out please that would be appreciated all right Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, Thank you all. See you in the future. Thank you. I'm Dana, Diana, and uh, Cynthia. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, you guys. Bye bye. Got the uh, got the slide. Um, Ron, thanks again, and thank you. Can't see if all the panelists are still here, but thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Marjorie. I'll follow up with you later. Okay, hopefully we'll see you at a future event. All right, bye, everyone.